you're up. All right, so uh, I, I, it's, it's really awesome. Uh, I've known Jack for almost two decades now. Um, his work really ultimately speaks for himself, uh, but very briefly, Jack is a retired uh, uh, US Forest Service um, research scientist. And uh, he, is, in my mind, is the godfather of the home ignition zone. Um, his, his research has spanned many, many, uh, many decades, not many, many decades, many decades. And, and his, his, um, his understanding of what makes homes burn in, in the wildland urban interface has been the focus, and I would say maybe the focus of his, his life's work. And so without further ado, as I said, I'll let Jack's work speak for himself. Um, my, my close personal friend and mentor, Dr. Jack Cohen. Thank you for being here, Jack. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all. So I'm going to immediately do the program here. And if anybody's on and can hear me, is the screen showing uh, the title? Uh, your screen share isn't uh, sharing yet, so this is Megan. Is it is it there? Um, let me see. So it should say community fire destruction, the title and the photo. It's a slide. We're not seeing the actual screen share, Jack. So you might want to stop share and reshare it. I will do that. Why am I not? Is it shared now? It's it's starting to share, yeah. And now I see your whole um, presentation. And now you should see with the view panel. Yep, we see. Yep, you are you are good to go, Jack. How are we doing? All good, Jack. We can see the slide, you're ready to go. So if if we see the whole slide only, I'm ready to go. Yep, you We're are. Good, Jack. OK. Ready to go, Jack. So talking about is community fire destruction during extreme wildfires. And in the in the title, in the, in the pamphlet, in the announcement, I talk about framing the problem. And in doing this framing, I'm specifically talking about home. So, and, and beyond that, wildland urban fire disasters, the many homes and businesses that burn to total destruction during extreme wildfire conditions. Well, to effectively manage wildland fire and prevent wildland urban fire disasters, which is essentially a brief statement of the cohesive strategy three pillars, we need to recognize the wildland fire context as disturbance, an appropriate ecological process, the resilience of our landscapes, and as a natural hazard, an initiator of burning. So let's take a look at the natural disturbance part very briefly. Wildland fire occurrence is inevitable. And the last 15,000 years, North American ecosystems, with a few exceptions, have developed with and were maintained by fire ignited by humans. And I want to emphasize ignited by humans and lightning since the end of the Ice Age. But what has happened since European discovery and settlement is the elimination of Native American burning, along with European settlement of agriculture, urban development, and modern attempts of fire exclusion. And this has greatly reduced and changed the character of wildland fire occurrence. Specifically, in the last 100 years, wildfire suppression has largely kept about 98% of wildfires small, and we've largely eliminated wildfire from its historical influence. The 2% that fails our initial attack attempts have become extreme 
most severe weather conditions, and those weather conditions occur actually less than 1% of the time. And this has generated what we call the wildfire paradox. That is, attempted wildfire exclusion has increased the potential for extreme wildfire conditions over extensive areas. Our attempt to exclude wildfire has made wildfire worse. And more importantly for this framing, these are the wildfires when wildland urban fire disasters occur. So let's segue into the natural hazard. So what we're seeing today with regard to wildland urban fire disasters is actually historical. Community destruction during extreme wildfires throughout our history. Let's go back to the 50 years roughly between 1870 and 1919, and we see in the Lake States primarily fires that, that not only killed civilians, but eliminated numerous entire towns. And when we look at the Peshtigo fire in 1871 on the order of 1,500 civilian fatalities, it occurred at the same time as the well-known Great Fire. Then after that, for the next roughly 65 years, we're looking at a decrease of of large fires and community destruction. Now about 100 civilian fatalities, but now actively trying to suppress fires, 400 firefighter burnover fatalities and about 5,000 homes destroyed. So the demarcation point of our current wildland urban fire attention occurred in 1985 when about 1,400 homes in Florida, North Carolina, and California, and this motivated, motivated the National Wildland Urban Interface Initiative of federal, state, and local agencies. And this led to programs that currently exist like FireWise USA, Fire Adapted Communities, and other current programs. How has this national recognition influenced our current wildland urban fire disaster occurrence since 1985? Here's a list. Starting in 1990, we have largely shown no let up. And in fact, in Colorado, five records in terms of homes totally destroyed. And particularly in the last five years, destroyed had numerous homes destroyed during events. And in fact, in 2018, we over the, overdid the number of destroyed structures from the national total be, of the 10 years between 1985 and 1994. So what has this national attention, increased suppression resources, and the collaborations done the increased trend of wildland urban fire disasters? Well, basically, we've continued the wildfire paradox. Our national focus on wildfire as a natural hazard with suppression as the principal response, particularly for community protection, continues largely not occurring as an appropriate ecological factor, particularly in the Western US, and communities are largely not becoming ignition resistant to extreme wildfires, and hence increasing disasters. So we have a conundrum. How can we have wildland fire as an appropriate ecological factor without having wildland urban fire disasters. Well, so wild, wildfires are inevitable and thus extreme wildfires are inevitable. So does this mean that wildland urban fire disasters are inevitable as well? And I respond to that with no, a resounding no. Given current best available science for understanding ignite, wildland urban fire destruction during an extreme wildfire hazard is a readable, readily preventable human disaster, not a natural disaster because of what we know. We're not victims in this problem. We're just not taking appropriate actions. Wildland urban fire science reveals opportunities 
for preventing wildland urban fire disasters without necessarily controlling extreme wildfire. What? We can prevent wildland urban fire disasters without controlling wildfires? Is there anything in our current activities that indicates that we're not going to be preventing or, or controlling wildfires? Given the perceptions expressed in media interviews, it the, indicates that this is inconceivable. So here's a sample. The firestorm descended like a dragon from hell on a foothill neighborhood. The waves, the wildfire swept through the community with a tsunami of flame. The wildfire literally exploded houses in flames, being destruction in its path. It was like a war zone. So then we go to scenes from the 2018 Paradise disaster during the campfire, and we look at unusual patterns of destruction. That's the question that journalists called me about after, and my response was, this is the typical pattern of destruction. So when we look at this destruction during an extreme wildfire, we, we put this together, this scene of total destruction, with a tsunami of gases flowing through the subdivision, vaporizing the subdivision, and we completely miss the fact that it surrounds unconsumed green vegetation. Why? Because we see what we believe. We don't believe what we see. So typical patterns of wildland urban fire destruction do not support walls of flame sweeping through communities and wildfires don't explode houses in flames. So let's take a look at the 1993 uh, uh, fire in Laguna, California, Southern California. See a house that survived without protection and it was called the Miracle House. But what else in this scene do we see that didn't burn. Yeah, the vegetation, a miracle vegetation. So when we look at this scene, a wildfire, these houses, as it turns out, with flammable wood roofs ignited from burning embers. The wildfire never reached the, this community and its destruction. We look at Los Alamos and we see total destruction within the community, a, a block within the community total destruction, unconsumed vegetation. A different location in Los Alamos. We see green vegetation, surface fire burned to make contact with the structures and the <coughs> And let's take a look at a video. The homes burning hours after the wildfire passed through the community, ignited not with intense wildfire, that never spread and spread to the community, it was surface fire making contact with the wood siding of the houses. Are burning, but not the tree canopies. So that the Cerro Grande fire was indeed a high intensity fire, but it was off more than a quarter of a mile away. So we take a look and at a home like this and typically home ignitions result from lofted burning embers and low intensity surface fire spreading to contact the structure. When we look at unconsumed tree copy amid total destruction, it indicates that wildfire flames did not spread through the community, burning trees did not ignite the homes, and the burning trees that we see or the burned trees that we see there adjacent to and over the homes actually ignited from the homes. And it was no different in Australia in 2009, the Melbourne fires. In 2017, in Napa, we see the same kind of pattern. In, during the car fire in 2018 and 2020 was different. So commonly communities burned by fire spreading through residential fuels, the vegetation and structures within the community. 
homes ignite and burn hours after significant wildfire activity has ceased at the community edge. Let's take a look at an example of a community that continues to burn without the wildfire. So here, Angora Fire, South Lake Tahoe, the intense wildfire spreads past about 30 in the afternoon, and then a low intensity surface fire spreads through a fuel treatment to make contact with the house on the fuel treatment side of the street, of the residential street, ignites the homes. They're burning loft from the burning homes into the community. And about an hour later, 3.30 to 5 p.m., we see the community burning until it runs out of So what do and consume vegetation and homes adjacent to total destruction indicate? Well, the wildfire does not spread through like a loud flash flood or a tsunami that explodes houses in flame, leaving total destruction in its wake. Intense sun across wide areas of a community structures does not occur. It's the local conditions as exemplified in this that determine home ignitions. So total destruction does not indicate high intensity wildfire exposure. These homes freely burned from low intensity ignitions without the ability of firefighters. Although initiated largely by embers from intense wildfires, burning residential fuels, the homes and vegetation continue the fire in the community. So let's remind ourselves that fire spreads as a sequence of ignitions. Ignitions and thus fire occur by meeting the requirements for combustion. So here we have the fire triangle, fuel, heat, and oxygen. Insufficiency, we have ignition. But what that tells us is that fire is a process at the fuel location, at the very fuel location. It's not a thing that travels from place to place, like a flood or a lava flow, or the momentum waves propagating out from the epicenter of an earthquake. Wildfire is not like any other natural hazards that we cope with. So in the case of wildland urban fire, a home ignition problem, now the fuel are the homes or is the homes. And the heat are all the burning objects adjacent to and on the homes and oxygen is always sufficient. Here's an example of local conditions that were not sufficient to ignite this house and yet high intensity surrounds it. And here we have local conditions that were sufficient to sustain ignition with no high intensity in the scene. So how far is it? And what conditions principally determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires? So that started my research, that question, using modeling experiments and examinations, and actually informally somewhat, examinations responsible for the initial questions and modeling that I did. And the results were that the characteristics of a home in relation to burning materials in its surroundings within 100 feet principally determine home ignitions during wildfires. And that 100 feet was an intended overestimate. Well, how can 100 feet be an overestimate? Our perception of, of high wildfire is that we have big flames. The things that we focus on are the big flames, largely not the burning embers. And our perception is it must be the big flames that are doing the ignitions. And yet, how would we know? Our perception is based on our human sensitivity to thermal pain and injury, which is much greater than the heating requirements for wood ignition. For example, a, a radiant exposure that produces a second degree burn in five seconds on my exposed skin takes over 27 minutes to ignite a wood wall. And what that means is that my human perception of ignition 
is not reliable. So for example, I am on the Grass Valley fire and I was talking with a strike team lead, an engine strike team leader at this location on site when this intense burning started that we see mostly on the left side. And he indicated that his strike engaged from this location because of the intense fire. And it was his belief that the houses that were there when they disengaged ignited by this high intensity. But then we start taking a look, examining this location, and we see that the destroyed house, a little more than 100 feet at its closest point from the highest intensity flames of that location. And the post split rail fence was about 45 feet from that location. And what we see is total destruction of the house. And yet at the split rail fence, we see no thermal decomposition, no char on that fence. And what that indicates to us is that it wasn't the flame exposure that ignited the house. It was something else. It was firebrands or burning embers, I should say, either directly on or around the house. And let's not forget, in that particular case, maybe the house next door was close enough. So we have the opportunity to reduce fuels within 100 feet of the home to discontinue intense fire spread, to prevent from intense radiant heating, and prevent surface fire flame contact with the home, as we see there without necessarily the wildfire. Again, as we see in the scene. So home ignitions during extreme wildfires are principally determined by the ignition characteristics of relation to burning objects within 100 feet of the home. And this area is called the home ignition zone. Here's an example, not a model for, not what you necessarily have to do, but an example of a home ignition zone. Intense crown fire spread, had insufficient flame heating from the reduced in intensity due to removal of vegetation in ember re resistant home. So let's look at this scene of a community primarily on the left side, but also a little bit on the side. A the first residential street, crown fire spreads, coherent crown fire spreads to that residential street, 40 feet between tree canopies, and yet the crown fire ceases with total destruction, home destruction on both sides of the street due to lofted burning embers from the crown fire into the next two and a half blocks of destroyed homes. So let's take a look at burning embers as the principal ignition member mechanism. And here is a chaotic scene from the of two individuals trying to deal with their brand ignitions. This is what it's like during a burning ember blizzard. Well, so burning embers are inevitable in wildfires, but don't burning embers come from beyond that 100 feet of the home? Well, yes, embers commonly ignite structures and vegetation within communities at distance of a half a mile or more during extreme conditions. And of course, this varies on the type of ignition. However, regardless of how far the, the burns are lofted from the intense wildfire, burning embers only generate home ignitions at the locations of accumulation within the home ignition zone. So let's take a look at an example, a research example we conducted at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety Research Center he generated a burning ember blizzard on a full-size house. Now, this full-size house had rain gutters, air, aluminum, and plastic PVC there full of pine needle debris. We put pine needle in the valley of the roof with fiberglass asphalt composition shingles. We've got pine needle mulch around the base and bark mulch around that corner. So let's take a look 
at the burning uh, ember blizzard on this house, vinyl fiber cement, that's like hardy plank and composite fiber composition board, which is uh, pressed fiber. So let's take a look only burning ember exposure, no flame front, no high intensity flame front. Look at the burning ember, they flow around the house on the roof and down into the gutter. And what we can't see clearly are the burning embers slamming into the wall, popping straight down to the base, igniting what we see within 30 to 40 seconds of the beginning of the ember we see flame contact on this structure, not due to a big flame front, but due to ember ignitions, the debris. When we did this without the, the litter around the base and in the rain gutters and in the, of the roof, there was no ignition on this home. Zero flame ignition and flame contact on the house. So notice that the burning pine needles in the plastic the PVC rain gutters, the rain gutters melt, collapse, and fall to the base of the house, but not the aluminum rain gutters. So the the plastic on the surface in those locations actually enhances the burning at the base of the house. And within about two minutes, we had full involvement of that one side and suppressed the fire. So once we have residential fuels, the burning structures and adjacent vegetation burning, they become significant sources of embers that continue community fire spread hours after significant wildfire exposures have ceased. And here's an example. This is at the very end, the last day, the end of the day, roughly, of that burning period in 2003 in Southern California where 3,600 houses were totally destroyed. Two houses are burning, contributing under relatively low wind conditions, these burning embers. They're larger than most embers from a, from a wildfire in conifers, but they don't go as far. So wildfire disasters do not occur from a tsunami of flames sweeping through the community. Houses do not literally explode in flames. It is not a war zone. And dragons from hell are definitely not to blame. So how do wildland urban fire disasters occur? Well, let's start with severe fire conditions. The combination of fuel, weather, and the topography given an ignition produces a rapid fire spread and rapid growth rates. It's not just the flame front that's spreading rapidly, it's the burning embers lofted in front that also increase these growth rates to, to unheard of kinds of rates, and of course the high intensities that generate the burning embers. Then given ignition vulnerable structures in our communities, we have multiple simultaneous ignitions of homes that overwhelms fire suppression. The resources cannot cover the exposure and definitely cannot cover the burning homes that occur. By and large, we have reduced to no fire protection on most homes within the community and the ignitions that sustain the homes burn freely to total destruction resulting in the disaster. So wildland urban fire disasters have only occurred during extreme wildfire conditions when wildfire suppression is ineffective and structure fire protection is overwhelmed. So how do we attempt to prevent wildland urban fire disasters today? Well, with wildfire suppression. And this fails to prevent wildland urban fire disasters during the extreme conditions 
of wildland urban fire disasters. So the inevitability of extreme wildfire conditions and our inability to control extreme wildfires suggests inevitable wildland urban fire disasters. However, what have we just learned? That home ignition, that the home ignition zone and its conditions primarily determine home ignitions during extreme wildfires. The total destruction within our communities commonly starts with small ember ignitions on and adjacent to the home that can be readily prevented. And if not prevented, not eliminated, then readily extinguished. So let's go back to our disaster sequence. We have extreme wildfires, but now we have ignition resistant communities. The houses don't ignite. And what that does then is it eliminates overwhelmed structure protection. It eliminates simultaneous ignitions on homes that cannot uh, be, be protected. And that eliminates the disaster. So we can make homes and communities ignition resistant by eliminating and reducing ignition factors within the home ignition zone. Wildland urban fire is a home ignition problem, none of controlling extreme wildfire. And that becomes a practical definition of wildland urban fire because we have choices over it being a home ignition problem where we have no choice over controlling the extreme wildfire. We can make homes ignition resistant during extreme wildfires by eliminating ignitions from flames within the home ignition zone and reducing ember ignitions of the home. Home ignitions during extreme wildfire full combustion process determined by conditions within the home ignition zone, not by an interface. This is why I've been calling it a wildland urban fire rather than a wildland urban interface because the interface or other geographic classifications don't relate, don't describe the ignition process. So resistant homes do not have flammable debris on the home and its flammable attachments. They do not have any burning material within five feet of the home and its flammable attachments. They do not have flame contact from within the home ignition zone, and they do not have high intensity burning within the home ignition zone. All things we have choices over, readily available choices over before the extreme wildfire. Burning embers, the ignition mechanism of wildfire home exposure. Well, so what about current building code, building fire codes? Commonly, fire codes designate in our current codes materials and designs with slow flame spread ratings, extended time wall, ceiling, and door fire penetration ratings, like our ratings. So wouldn't such fire codes help prevent wildland urban fire disasters? No, why not? Well, because if nobody is there to extinguish small ignitions, then it doesn't matter how long it takes to penetrate the structure. It doesn't matter how slow fire involvement is, it still burns to total destruction because the codes that commonly occur today facilitate fire control by reducing interior fire involvement rates. It assumes firefighter response. So without protection from firefighters or residents, any sustained ignition results in total destruction. The message of this slide is that what we do with regard to our codes has to match the wildfire exposure context of the problem. So what about high, de high density development like this? What this, if initiated, becomes an urban conflagration. And the result of this urban conflagration is complete overwhelming of fire protection to urban destruction. So, in this case, this would be a 
likely candidate for codes that, that begin to guide what the exterior of our homes are like. Non-flammable siding like fiber cement. Also on the eaves, boxing with non-flammable. Window space, minimized or eliminated using either wire glass or tempered glass and flammable between these structures. In this case, the closest proximity, at least on one side of structure, was about eight to 10 feet between homes. So making our homes ignition resistant means having wildfires without wildland urban fire disasters. Thank you. Jack, thank you. I'll wait for Christina to come on too, but but uh, thank you very much, Jack. Um, I did want to, I did want to, um, just wanted to highlight. Uh, Megan, can you turn off the screen share for Jack, please? Yeah. Um, and and I am here also. Sorry, I was having a little bit of tech issues on my end. Uh, thanks, Christina. If uh, again. Um, and, and for all y'all out there, um, Jack has provided us with some, you know, uh, let's call it new information. Um, let's, let's pretend that this morning was the first time that we heard about this. And, um, and now we have this new information um, to go forward. And, and again, remember back to the pillar, uh, the fire adaptive community pillar. That is where, that is where the bulk of, that, that is where my responsibility lies. I, I am the staff specialist for uh, the four fire adapted communities, which means there is another, you know, program manager for safe and effective fire response, another program manager for uh, resilient uh, landscapes. And so again, I emphasize to this group, let's focus on our pillar, our lane. And, and, and I hear, I've heard Jack's, Jack's research, uh, and I've heard Jack's presentations now going on near two decades, and um, not much has changed in those presentations, just a lot more examples of, um, uh, of where uh, uh, fire uh, that does not meet the requirements of combustion. So where, where on the landscape that does not meet the requirements of combustion means no fire burns there, right? And then I'm gonna also say, right? Lighter, you can't quite see it, but there's a lighter in my hand. If that lighter does not touch this paper, if that, Okay, well, my green screen's not working. Mark, but hey. we, we have a lot of questions and we've only got, got it, seven Christina, minutes for them. So we're much. wrapping up. So yeah. right here in the state of Nevada, what I'd like to emphasize at this point is, is, that, is that let's us focus on the ignition resistant component and allow our partners in the two other pillars to do their job. And we meet together to accomplish this notion called Fire Adapted Nevada. Great. Great, thanks Mark and Jack, great, great talk. I just wanted to add quickly um, on our website, which is www.livingwithfire.com. We have a lot of information for folks on how to implement defensible space, how to choose the right plants for Nevada. And in, in January, we'll be, uh, we'll be releasing a new publication that will help folks learn how to retrofit their home for wildfire. So doing a lot of, 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 of these things that, that Jack is hoping that folks will do. There were several questions asking if folks will be able to use these, these slides in the future. Yes, we will have the recording archived on our YouTube channel for UNR Extension. And we'll also have that up on our livingwithfire.com website. So yes, uh, you will have access to the presentation to show to your communities. Um, uh, there's a, a, a comment from, from Eric gave on. He's a fire marshal up in Tahoe. He says, so what we have here is a failure to communicate about the home ignition problem. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> um, and then uh, next, so here's like the first actual question for you, Jack. As a, wild, as a federal wildland firefighter, what role do we have in a wooly fire situation? Should resources be devoted to structure community protection during extreme conditions that make fires resistant to suppression rather than control? What role do land management agencies have in helping communities prepare for inevitable fires? 
So it's a two part question, one about the role in structure protection, and then the second about the role that these land management agencies have. So one of the things that, that I've thought a considerable uh, mm -hmm. much about, um, particularly after having early days being a fire behavior analyst on incident management teams is how can we deal with communities and how with communities during wildfires and over and over and over again and I've been on panels and I've talked with incident commanders we need well we have evolved to have structure fire protection units in during these wildfires what we are tending not to do is to formally create a wildland urban division where the goals of that division are not to stop the wildfire, it's to prevent the disaster. And that's a very different goal than the incident management team, which is to contain the wildfire. At this point in this division, the wildland urban division, what we are going to do and the amount of time that we have between when we engage in this community before the fire and when the wildfire actually begins to expose the community determines how much we can actually do, which gets back to what we're saying, we can't be effective without you. So if homeowners haven't created an ignition resistant community, there isn't a whole lot do with this community to, to prevent the ignitions. Uh, let me give you an example. Southern California, Woolsey Fire, they had 100 engines with LA County on this fire with 50,000 houses. So, you know, what are you going to do with your free time? And, and so they were totally overwhelmed in this regard. If the houses had been ignition resistant, then we begin to reach parity in the task of protection. Okay, so as a wild land oppression group, basically what we need to do is to facilitate the motivation of communities to get ignition resistant instead of implicitly or explicitly telling people that we're going to protect them with fuel breaks treatments because what we do in the wildland is that other context that that what the disturbance natural disturbance context rather than the natural hazard context and ironically without existing communities we're not going to be able to have fire as an ecological process in our landscapes because it's going to demand that we control the wildfire or the wildland fire. And we can't do that at landscape scales. We, there's too much to there's too much yeah. to have burn in order to maintain control. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So the, okay. So the, yeah, Should go ahead. Should we move on to another one? Um, yeah, yeah. Is the 100 foot HIZ area enough for homes on a slope? Well, so if we're on big slopes, we may have to increase that 100 feet in order to prevent flame contact. What it doesn't do is change the physics, the direction, the approach. What we don't want to do is to necessarily cut down our vegetation. One, for the ambiance, we probably won't do it. Two, it's expensive, and three, it at, at one point, it does constructive. So what we would want to do is potentially go beyond 100 feet, probably no more than 200 feet. And at that particular point, we need to, to do considerable of the vegetation at the beginnings. So in other words, at the far extent of that, home ignition zone that's 150 feet away, we begin to, to put more spacing in that 
that home ignition zone between the two. Also, we should encourage deciduous hardwoods, uh, aspen, uh, ash, whatever will grow and be maintained easily in your particular area, we should start favoring deciduous hardwoods because they don't matter. And in that case, they will actually begin to block the, the flaming. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, we got one more here. Um, this is a, it's a comment, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I heard that in some places in Australia, it was passed by public vote, not unanimous, that all new homes have to be made of steel with appropriate roofs, defensible space, etc. I wonder if we'll get there here. <laughs> Um, it's a, um, well, I, I'm not optimistic that that type of thing will, will fly, um, in the United States, but. So let me answer it from a personal standpoint. And that is, I wouldn't say that I, I would never describe myself as a pessimist or an optimist. And because it is so readily attainable to have ignition resistant homes, and our themselves actually break up the vegetation to the point of where we don't have high intensity spread into the community from the wildfire. I have a great deal of hope that given the appropriate perception of the problem as a wild, as a, as a home ignition problem, that in that case we will begin to engage just through what might be called common sense or, or an appreciation for engagement can readily change the ignitability of our homes. And yes, I do have hope that we can reach that case. Great, okay, there, there's one last question. It's kind of two combined. First person says, like alarm systems, do insurance companies offer incentives for home hardening? Are there tax incentives to implement these measures? And then the next one is how do we get the insurance or mortgage industry to get on board with requiring fire resistant con construction? I will say that um, I, that one of the reasons you know that that we're excited to start to implement the Firewise program in Nevada is that Firewise it, that insurance companies more and more are recognizing a Firewise certification, um, and then that helps for rates to go down in those communities not have that certification. But Jack, did you wanna yeah, speak let me, to that? Let me speak to that quickly by saying, I encourage you to go to the Boulder County, Colorado Wildfire Partners website, get an idea of what they've done with regard to certifying homes as ignition resistant. And then in a partnership with, with major insurance companies, the, those insurance companies have accepted that certification as, a, as an insurance criteria. So what was happening in Colorado is the insurance companies of the standard homeowner policies, they were essentially canceling the wouldn't insure because they don't charge enough for fire liability in order to make it motivating. But so what they were doing in high situations, their high exposure to liability, they were just canceling policies. So wildfire partners uh, uh, assesses the ignitability of the homes and Boulder County has some regulation that they have to be able to do that. But the, the payoff is that the insurance companies trust that certification and will insure you. So there are several locations, communities, uh, which would tend to be exceptional currently, particularly in the West, where we're trying to get that started, where we're trying to get so that insurance companies will trust the assessment and continue the, the insurance in high value locations, uh, liability kinds of situations, separate riders are, are written for that house. So it's Chubb and AIG companies like that. And they found in Malibu in some cases where a survivor, the premium for fire insurance went from 12, 13,000 a year to 36,000 a year. 
And so now there is a financial motivation rather than just an insurability motivation. That's where we need to go. One of the reasons we're not there is because we don't have a broad level of subject matter expertise. And that's where I would really like to see us go is where we have an equipment protection engineers for the, the uh, urbanized Northeast in particular, we, we need protection engineering to begin to, to create standards and guidelines for wildland urban conditions. Well, that was great, Jack. Thank you for everything. We are running up on the break here. We're already Christina? over, so we're gonna, we're gonna have Christina? to adjourn people to their break. You can have one last little comment, Mark, but I'm gonna let people know Thank that you, they Christina. can leave for the break. Yes, and I just wanna emphasize that Firewise USA is not a certification program. Firewise USA is a recognition program. And the, the talk that Jock, the, 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 the talk that Jack was talking about certifying homes is a conversation that we want to have in our fire adapted Nevada. So um, I'm going to leave it at that uh, um, in regards to that, but just an emphasis, we're not certifying homes today in the state of Nevada. And if you are a part of a FireWise community, you are not receiving certification you are receiving recognition for your efforts. Thank Sorry, you so that was, much, Jack. That was my error. Thank you so much, yeah. Jack. Very much appreciate it. And um, thanks, Christina. And if, if anyone has any more questions for Mark or for Jack, please feel free to continue sending those to questions for speakers. And we'll make sure to get those answered and emailed back to the group for sure.